Hey guys, Seth Perkins here from Beard of Butcher Blend Seasoning. And I'm Scott Perkins. We're coming back at you again. We've got a um, beautiful venison here that we're going to be processing. We're going to be going through uh, much the same as we've already brought you. We're going to be uh, just more or less breaking down this carcass from start to finish, incorporating um, our seasonings and a bunch of different products that we have um, available to us. Today we're going to be using Outdoor Edge, uh, Weston products, of course, Beard of Butcher Blend seasoning, and we're going to have some fun going through this deer and just breaking it down like you guys would do at home. So um, as we go through here, I'll, I'll be talking about the different steps that Seth is taking. Um, these are pretty much the methods that we've used on hundreds of deer, and we know that they work uh, very well for, for this application. Um, we won't be using any power um, processing equipment except for a uh, meat grinder and uh, a vacuum sealer. So this can all basically be done just uh, in your garage or on your tailgate or however you, you wanna work it out at home. So using our Outdoor Edge products, we're going to get this carcass broke down and systematically go through the process of uh, what you need to do to turn this um, deer carcass into some really enjoyable, palatable cuts of venison. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get rolling. What I'm going to do is we're going to start at the hind quarter of this deer and then we will be working our way towards the front. Um, we're going to get everything separated out into different muscle structures and then bring different items back onto the table to show you how to further process that particular item. So we're going to go ahead and uh, just get started. So what I'm, what I'm pulling out right here are the inside loins of this deer. A lot of times um, guys will actually miss these when they're processing or they will actually, um, they don't even know they're there and they will cut into them when they're field dressing their deer. You definitely don't want to miss these when you're processing and uh, field dressing your deer. Delicious little tender morsel of meat right there. Yeah, I refer to these in one of our videos as a fish tender. Um, it's, it's just basically one of the um, sort of slang names for it. It's, it's a tenderloin. If, you were, if this were a beef, we'd be referring to this um, as a tenderloin where we cut our filet mignons from. And it, and it certainly is the most tender portion of an entire animal. So these are a great item. Just you want to get these off and set them aside so that we can get those processed and packaged up here in a few minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and use Outdoor Edge's saw. Um, typically in a commercial environment, we would use a meat saw or we would use our band saw, but um, we're gonna go ahead and use the Outdoor Edge saw today. So you see that made pretty short work of cutting through this vertebrae right here. And that just makes things a little bit easier. Now Seth's gonna actually be using um, some downward pressure to, to separate this ball joint. Um, if you notice, he's kind of pulled this to the edge of the table and that's just gonna help him gain some leverage by working off of the edge of the table and he can actually break this hind quarter. Um, this hind quarter is gonna be made up of about four different muscle groups. We're gonna be talking about the sirloin, um, what we would refer to as the top round, um, the inside round and the eye of round. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set that beautiful piece of venison aside and break it down a little bit further. This is um, this was a uh, a buck that was harvested here in um, in Ohio. We do have um, a little bit of age on this animal, and that's by design. We like to age our venison when when available with the right temperatures for um, a period of three to seven days. That seems to kind of be the magic formula. Even if um, if you're if you have no sort of uh, cooler a facility to age uh, your deer in. It's, it's been asked, you know, can you use a refrigerator and that sort of thing? Those are not ideal environments. Typically you want to age this as a carcass. Um, even, you know, the last couple of days here in Ohio, it's been, it's been close to 60 degrees uh, during the day. However, at night it's, it's down to 30 degrees. So with, with regard to aging venison, 
you're going to want to use um, the temperature to your advantage. So definitely stay out of the sunlight. If you've got a barn or garage you can hang it into with those cooler nighttime temperatures, you're going to find that you can age venison most of the time during season because it's obviously in the cooler climate. You can age that venison at home, um, leave it as a carcass. You can even do it hide on. Um, certainly don't want to fly, uh, the flies to get to it or anything like that. So I, I would say if your temperatures, if your daytime, daytime temperatures are not exceeding 50 degrees and your nighttime temperatures are dropping down to that freezing mark, you're at, at some of the optimal range to age your venison. Um, so do it in a barn, in a um, garage. Those areas are always cooler anyway. Somewhere obviously that animals can't get to it. And go ahead and see if you can get a couple of days because it's really going to enhance that meat. I can tell just by looking at the color of this meat that it's, um, it's got some very unique properties that only come by aging venison. Absolutely. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take these hindquarters, we're going to move them over to our, our table back here. We're going to come back with these and explain the different muscle structures and how to break these hindquarters down into uh, jerky strips. So that's going to start with the next portion of uh, the breakdown, which we're going to, so we've separated the hind uh, quarters. Now it's on to the front quarters. And once again, we are going to just use a knife. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to break these front shoulders off without the use of a saw. Most of this time, with a little bit of careful study, this animal is going to tell you by um, just visual cues where things go together. And usually what you'll find is when you're between the muscles, you're going to find that uh, membrane that separates the muscles so you can follow that membrane. Um, obviously, experience plays a, a major role here, but um, hopefully with the use of this video, you're going to gain uh, a shortcut. So just follow the steps that Seth's taking here. And as you can see, I just I make little cuts, and then you and then the the uh, muscle piece yeah. it pretty much just pulls right out. And we do like doing this on the table because you can use that leverage. Obviously, the weight of the carcass um, you can use it, and he can pull up. And so he's applying pressure to that leg as he's using his knife. Um, two things that you're going to learn in um, processing are pressure or you know and or leverage and then angles it's just about finding the correct angle making sure you're in the right spot and um, and then just using the leverage to, to gain you know the, the right uh, pressure to take stuff apart so as you can see here this is where the shoulder blade is so inside here is where the bones located um, there's a knuckle here and a knuckle here so what we're going to do is, um, in the next video series, show you, like we do, uh, like we're going to with the hindquarters, how to break down the shoulders as well. Now is the time that we are going to remove the back straps on both sides. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that. That's right, back straps. You guys have heard this word time and time again when it com comes to your venison, and that's that prized chunk of meat that we cut the chops off right along the spine right here. So what Seth's doing is he's, he's you know, if you've ever filleted a fish, you kind of know what he's doing. He's keeping his knife right along the bone, and he's running it right along the edge of that back strap, and he's actually going pretty far up in here to the neck because that muscle every one of these muscles has a cousin, has a neighbor that lives next door. And so you can kind of just follow it all the way up until you'll find that it, it, it sort of just runs out. Um, so he's made a, he's made a cut um, across the, the, the spine here, um, all the way over to the edge where his knife actually stops against the bone. Um, so he's made sort of that horizontal cut. Now he's making that vertical cut. And if done correctly, um, this is going to come just, just like a fillet would come out of a fish. He's going to pull that out. And I'm telling you, this is the prized piece of venison. Um, obviously, we talked about those tenderloins being su such a delicacy, but there's just not a lot of it. However, you've got a beautiful four or five pound chunk of, of venison here um, that's going to be some amazing eating. So we're not done with this yet. We've, uh, we've extracted from the carcass. We do like to do a little bit more um, sort of cleanup work on it. So that way, when you go and put it on your plate, all the work is done. 
and you can enjoy that eating experience or if you've got your wife or um, your parents over for a nice dinner, you're not sort of uh, watching them jerk a piece of sinew out of their mouth because that's a really unpleasant eating experience. And a lot of this um, so-called processing or prep work is going to just lead to a really enjoyable um, experience at the plate. And so obviously that's our end goal is we want to we want to actually remove some of the stigma i guess if you will about eating venison that maybe got attached to it with uh, sort of in, improper handling if this venison is is um to the point actually to the point that we've already got it at we already know that it's going to be an amazing eating experience just based on the fact that it was um uh, a, a quick humane kill that it was um we sort of did that dry aging where we, we hung the carcass for uh, a, a period of, I think we've got, what do we got on this carcass, Seth? Seven days. Seven today. days. So with a buck, if you can get those seven days, um, that's, it's just so, simply going to be amazing. I can tell just from experience looking at this, this venison um, that, at, that we've already done a lot of our, our really, so to speak, um, the, the good magic has already happened and we're just going to kind of complete that process. So. We're going to take these uh, back straps, we're going to set them aside, um, and we're going to show you how to clean them up and cut them into some beautiful chops in the next series. All right, so now that we've got our back straps separated, Seth's going to demonstrate, we get asked the question a lot, what about the deer ribs? So he's going to demonstrate what he needs to do to extract those from this carcass. A lot of guys are running smokers in their backyards now, and what better item to put in your smoker in your backyard than deer ribs. So we're going to go ahead and show you how to pull these out. First thing we're going to do is split this brisket, and Outdoor Edge makes this uh, big beefy knife, and it's, this will be great for splitting this, this, these brisket bones here. So you see, Seth's a big guy, he kind of made that look easy, but a lot of these bones do have cartilage where they're um, where they're going to be connected. Uh, as you gain experience, you'll find out where that is. You can also use your saw for this point. Um, you know, obviously safety is paramount. We don't want you to wind up in the emergency room just getting this deer carcass processed. Um, but with these great tools that we have, that shouldn't be much of a problem. Now Outdoor Edge has, has put everything in their, their little butcher kit um, that you could possibly need for butchering your deer. This little saw works great. As you can see, I cut down through those ribs. So sometimes Seth will, will actually set his boning knife aside so that he can get a heavier bladed knife because that's going to help him if he's actually going to be cutting through some of the cartilage that connects this venison carcass together. So what we could do here, you can either leave these as a whole slab. Um, if they're too big for your smoker, there's a um, uh, some cartilage right here that you can actually cut through with your knife. And a lot of times this piece down on the bottom is not as enjoyable to eat anyway. If this were um, pork, we would refer to these now as the St. Louis ribs after that portion is removed. Um, it's just, it's got a lot of heavy bone and cartilage in that portion. So you, you, can, you can certainly smoke it if you like. However, a little bit more pleasant of an eating experience just dealing with the actual rib bone to eat around and then you can um, you can trim that out which we'll, we're going to do here in a minute and, and add it to some of your ground products. Deer ribs. Those would be uh, delicious with some uh, oh I'd probably go with original beard butcher seasoning and uh, finish them off with a little bit of barbecue sauce at the end kind of caramelize them low and slow for probably three to four hours. That's one of the other things we're um, 
we're wanting to kind of break that mold or step outside of the box with venison because so often you've been handed a piece of chunk of this or it's chili or something like that where the where they um the meat you know it's like oh it's deer meat you know that we can get away from that um, that was kind of the old school way of thinking what we can do now with some of this experience we can produce uh, some really tremendous products such as the beer the deer ribs and we love using our seasonings because um, two of our main ingredients are um, the garlic and the onion powder which really pair well with the wild game and that's one of the reasons why we created them so that's one of the things that we've found that we've not had a um, unpleasant eating experience with our seasonings on wild game. So that's one of the big things that we're, um, we're kind of pointing out is that if you were to just take this, this deer and grind it all up into a product that the flavor's lost, um, we feel like you might be losing out a little bit on that eating experience. All right, guys, we want to talk about one of the most sought after pieces in any wild game. And that is the backstrap. We're going to show you how to trim this out, remove the silver skin or the sinew off the back, and turn this in to an amazing, amazing cut. We're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, if you start on this side, you can see here where this, this muscle can separate, and I can actually do it with my hands here. Just a little bit of help with a knife. <clears throat> Go ahead and separate that muscle. Continue working it down. This piece will get turned into trimmings, which Scott's going to work on. One very, very important step with trimming out this back strap is there's this real thick piece of of spinal sinew right here. You want to take the very first thing and you, you want to cut this off. Just go ahead and down along the whole side of the back strap and just remove that thick piece of sinew. Some people will save this sinew. They'll make uh, traditional bowstrings and things like that. Um, if that's something you do, that's, you know, these are some great pieces to save. So now that I have that thick piece of sinew removed off this edge, what I'm going to do is go ahead and start at the, at the thick end of this back strap, not the small end. I'm going to start at the thick end. And we're going to remove the silver skin off the back of this back strap. What I like to do is make a first initial cut all the way down to the silver skin, but not through it. And it'll actually give you a little piece to kind of hang your fingers on to. Starting with your knife, you can slowly work your knife down that back strap, removing this silver skin in a pretty quick fashion. One trick that Seth's using, if he misses a spot, it's tapered. He usually, he can turn his knife over and work against, you know, or away, actually away from him. Just sort of catch right underneath that and, um, <clears throat> and peel that off. Like I said earlier, oftentimes you can, you can use the, the fish filleting method when you're working at separating a small piece of tissue. So what you see here is a back strap where the, sinew, the silver skin of the sinew has been removed off the back. Everything's been removed off the side and we'll go ahead and start cutting this into chops. Typically what we do is we cut them about an inch and a quarter thick and what you have right there is a beautiful venison backstrap, boneless deer chop. Um, some of these can be butterflied and what you would do in that scenario is just go ahead and cut it about as twice, about twice as thick as one of these and then you'll cut it down the middle but not cutting all the way through and go ahead and just open it up into a back or into a butterfly chop and we'll just finish this out all the way down. So what you're left with is some amazing venison boneless chops. And like we mentioned earlier, by removing all of the sinews or silver skin 
when you put these on the plate, they're gonna be ready to go and turn out absolutely awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and just keep uh, working here. We'll go ahead and do the second one. Um, the first one went pretty quick, so I think we can get this one done in the same fashion. And I'll show you a technique on this next one that I don't know if too many guys are doing. So you can see just that one, that one swipe that removes almost all of that silver skin off that back. Beautiful, clean Ohio whitetail backstrap. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prepare this for a cut that we like to do that is a butterflied backstrap that you fill with whatever you wish. It could be feta cheese and peppers and onions. It could be cream cheese and jalapenos. Um, you could do one of each. You could do whatever flavor cheese you want. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you how to prep that now. First thing I like to do is we're going to go ahead and cut this in thirds. And we're going to use the thickest portion of this back strap to do that. So we're going to use these two pieces. This one might be a little bit more difficult because it is small. We're going to go ahead and go ahead and add this one to our chops. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and butterfly these. And I'll show you how to do that now. Placing your hand on the top of this back strap, you want to make a cut as close to the table as you can without actually cutting through the meat. And what you want to do is just continue to roll this out as you're cutting. Just continue rolling it. And what you could imagine here is a, uh, like a pumpkin roll, kind of the same procedure, and just continue to roll this out. Depending on how thick the back strap is, um, it's going to depend on how many times you can do this. Looks like we're going to go ahead and get about four about four rolls out of this. So as you can see here, go ahead and square it up a little bit. This piece can get filled with whatever you want to put in it and then you fill it and simply roll it up and then tie it and your contents will be in the center. So there's one. We'll go ahead and do the other one here too. If you cut, if you do happen to cut through it, it's not a real big deal. Um, there'll just be a little hole there. You might have a little cheese or something leak through it, but it's not the end of the world. Slowly working this out and open it up like so. And bam, perfect. There you have it, folks. You're going to enjoy this portion of your venison, that's for sure. So as you can see, you'd probably never guess that that was a venison backstrap. And guarantee you, those are going to be amazing. All right, guys, so this next segment, we are going to show you how to break down a deer hindquarter for jerky or roast, whichever you prefer. So we have one, just one side here, and we're going to go ahead and get started. 
Seth made a cut right here. He went ahead and cut that, that tendon. And then you could get your bone knife out here. Um, however, this one has some really soft cartilage that attaches this knee joint. So he just went ahead and he used a little bit of downward pressure and he worked his knife right through there, which is something that you can learn pretty quickly. That one's a pretty easy one to learn. Next step, we're gonna go ahead and make a cut down along this big femur bone that runs on the inside of this hind quarter. Take the tip of your knife and just run right down along the bone, working it right out of these muscles. So once we have the bones removed, we have a 100% boneless chunk of meat. And in this hind quarter, there are three different muscle structures located inside here. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to remove those three. First of all, we have what we refer to as the round tip. We're going to go ahead and pull this out. And this isn't necessarily included in one of those three. Although it can be used for jerky, um, makes a beautiful roast. In my opinion, if you're going to save a roast off of a deer, that one right there is the best. So once you get that muscle removed, that's the round tip, we'll go ahead and start on these three muscle pieces located in this hind quarter. Everything separates very easily by a seam. I mean, I could actually take my finger and separate that with my finger. Um, so go ahead, just follow the seam. We have a top round. Gonna go ahead and pull this little piece out right here that was had the uh, shank attached to it. We have the eye of round. Located right here between the eye of round and the bottom round, there's a little chunk of fat. And this is where I wanna talk about um, a step that's very important. Inside this little chunk of fat, there's a gland. Um, as you can see right there, I went ahead and cut into it. There's a gland located there. You definitely want to remove that gland out of the inside of that hind quarter. That can give your, uh, your meat almost a bitter, kind of a foul taste. So watch out for that one. Get it removed. Get it out of there. You don't, definitely don't want that in. So what we have here is that round tip. We have a top round, eye of round, and a bottom round. What we'll do now is we will continue trimming these out, removing the exterior fat, and prepping these for jerky. As you can see here again, this outer piece comes off real, real easily. Remove all the fat. And if you look at this top round piece, you can see that the, that the uh, muscle fibers are running this direction. So what you want to do is cut against the grain like this. And you want to cut these about an inch to an inch and a quarter thick slices. that you can take, come back to these, take that slice, and just cut them like this into whatever thickness of jerky you would like. And if you look at these pieces, if you look at these pieces real close, the muscle fibers are going this way. So that when you um, go to eat this and you go to chew it, these pieces pull apart and makes for a very good um, pleasant eating experience. As Seth's breaking that down, I've just been working through the trimmings here. And um, as mentioned earlier, if, if I were saving bones for broth, um, this is where I would start making some choices. These are the marrow bones. Um, a lot of people will roast these in your oven before you make a, um, a marrow or stew. 
And then one of the other things that we like to do is um, the ends of these, sort of where the, these connect to the tendon, um, we'll go ahead and remove those. Those are, those are uh, got some real hard cartilage. We'll remove those from the trimmings. You can add that into your um, bone broth if you're making that, or just simply discard them. Uh, the sirloin t piece that came off the round here is a great piece for stew. That's one of, one of the things that you can use for stew that's going to make a really tender stew or a stir fry that you can pre-cut, or you can, um, you can simply save it as a roast. Seth mentioned this, um, this round tip or this sirloin tip. Once again, makes a really beautiful roast, or here's where you can make a choice. We often are seeking out the uh, pieces that are free of any intermuscular um, connective tissue for our jerky. So that's a reason why a roast like so um, oftentimes we'll find does have a, a bit more of the um, inner sinew, so we'll, we'll save it as a roast and not for the jerky. However, it does make um, some fine jerky if you want to take the time. And so what I'll do with this sirloin here is I just sort of cut it, um, all the, the connective tissues off the outside, and then go ahead and cut that into cubes of uh, about one inch. And that seems to make a really nice size, and you can package that up separately and make yourself a really nice, uh, use it even for like steak tips and noodles, or you can just make a really nice stew meat out of something like that we found from the sirloin. So that pretty much completes our processing of the round. We've got the extra, extra trimmings that have come off of it. We've got our um, little bit of stew meat. We've got a beautiful uh, sirloin tip or round tip roast. And then Seth's working on cutting some really nice whole muscle jerky that we're going to season up with our beard or butcher blend. And um, you can use various methods of dehydration, um, smoking. You can even use your oven at home to make that into some wonderful jerky. Absolutely. And then um, a lot of people want to know where the jerky um, actually best parts that, you know, where they come from off of the, off the deer. The round for sure is the best part for jerky. You can get a little bit out of the uh, shoulder if you wish. Um, so yeah, just remember the biggest thing when you're cutting this, um, cut it so that you end up with a piece that the grains are going this way. Um, you'll enjoy that a lot more. As far as the amount of jerky we're going to get off this deer, uh, a deer this size, we're probably going to get somewhere in that 15 pound range by the time we get this all trimmed out. We only want the best strips for jerky, so you're looking at about 15 pounds, and that's start weight. So you start with 15 pounds, and it's going to reduce by about 50% by the time we get done smoking it. So in the end, you're looking at that 7 to 8 pounds of eating meat that's uh, finished jerky. Hey everyone, Seth Perkins here from Beard of Butcher Blend Seasonings. Today I want to show you how to make jerky with our seasoning blend. Today we're making venison jerky, which this is cut from the round portion of a uh, white tail here in Ohio. But you can use this recipe for just about any kind of jerky. You can make it in beef, you could make it in um, goose, pretty, elk, whatever kind of wild game or, um, you know, a domestic animal that you want to make jerky out of, you can certainly use this recipe. So what, what we're going to do is I have 12 pounds of meat here. And so our magic ratio with our seasoning is one bottle, which is six ounces, for 12 to 13 pounds of meat. Um, one ounce of our seasoning will do two pounds. So we're going to go ahead and use Chipotle today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the meat in the mixing bowl, and then I'm going to go ahead and add our seasonings to it. I also have an ha a half of an ounce of pink tinted cure. Um, this will help preserve the meat. It's going to give it a nice red color when we smoke it. Um, and I've weighed out a half of an ounce. So we're going to go ahead and add that too. So we'll, we'll put our, our meat right in our mixing bowl. Like that. 
And then we're going to go ahead and add our tinted cure, pink salt. And this, this pink salt is available um, online. Any home butcher store, anything like that, you can just Google pink curing salt. Um, this is available in a little one ounce pack. It's real handy. You can split it and use it for 12 to 13 pounds of meat. At this point, we're going to go ahead and add a whole bottle of our Chipotle Beard of Butcher Blend seasonings. I'm going to go ahead and put just about half of it in at this point, and I'm going to start giving it a, a little mix. I want it to be evenly distributed throughout the batch. So now that I have it mixed up about halfway, I go ahead and add the rest of the contents of the bottle. This is a very simple process. Um, anybody can do this at home. It's really not difficult. And this is going to make your wild game taste absolutely incredible. You can go to the grocery store um, and pick up a pack of beef jerky or you can make your own from a deer that you harvested and then pass it out to your buddies on the weekends and brag about the awesome jerky you made. So as I'm mixing this, I'm just making sure that the seasoning is evenly distributed throughout this batch. And once I feel that I've got it to a point where I know that all the strips are covered, I'm going to go ahead and stop, and as you can see, that is what the jerky looks like seasoned with our chipotle seasoning. I'm going to go ahead and let this rest overnight, so it, this is a dry rub, there's no liquid. I'm going to let it rest overnight, and tomorrow we will put this in our hickory smokehouse. We'll smoke it at about 165 to 170 degrees for about six hours. We're going to take the internal temperature of this jerky to about 165 degrees. There is going to be moisture um, along with the smoke in our oven just to make sure that the jerky doesn't dry out. You can put this in your home smoker, um, your electric smoker. You can use a pellet grill. You can use a big green egg grill. You can use your oven, food dehydrator. However you want to take this jerky um, and dry it down to a point where it reaches temperature, and it's at the moisture content you feel like you want it to be at, you can certainly do that at home. The other thing is, is this is 12 pounds of meat. When this cooks down, it's going to lose about 50% of its weight. So what we're going to end up with is about six to seven pounds of finished jerky that you can be proud of because you made it yourself. So the next thing we're going to go over is a deer shoulder. Um, we're going to talk about a few things we can get out of here. Obviously, um, we can trim this out and we can use it for our grindings. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple little hidden secrets in here that uh, you might not know about. First of all, right located right on the top of this shoulder, right against the neck, in this little piece of fat, we have another gland. So if you can imagine seeing this on the deer, right on the top of its shoulder, on the inside, right at the top of the shoulder blade, there is a gland that you're going to want to remove. So we're going to go ahead and discard that gland. And then just getting started, I like to just get this knuckle popped first and separate the shoulder blade from the rest of this the shank portion. This portion right here, um, a little bit of it may be able to be used for some jerky or you know some stew meat or something like that, but today's application we are going to trim it out for our further grindings. So while Scott works on that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the rest of this. So as I trim this meat off the top of this, or actually the bottom of the shoulder blade, you can see that it exposes that bone. 
flipping that piece over. And you could certainly cut this in half and you know, use it for a roast or something like that. Today, we're gonna do something a little bit different. So this is called the top blade steak or otherwise known as a flat iron. You've probably seen them in a grocery store um, from a beef. I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to cut it from a deer. So following this bone, there's actually, on both sides, there's this bone that runs a whole length. And if you cut on, you can cut on both sides if you'd like, but if you cut on this side, it's gonna be the wider portion. You can pull this flat iron right out of here. <clears throat> slowly working it out. And if you take your knife and you cut right down against the bone, you can remove that whole muscle, which used to be located right here. You can just pull that whole thing right out. The rest of this, we would use for maybe some stew meat, you can cut a little bit of jerky out of it, out of it if you want to uh, take the time to do that. What we're left with here is the shoulder blade. You can see the wider portion is where that top blade stake's located that uh, we're gonna finish out for the flat iron. So we just start trimming here. And as you can see, we end up with this real nice muscle. This piece, this, this top blade piece. So we have a real nice muscle on this side and a real nice muscle on that side. We do have to separate the two. So here again, using the, the fish fillet method, just go ahead and work your knife down along that sinew. You can see it exposes that silver skin there. So you have this piece. Go ahead and flip it over. Doing the same thing on this side. Slowly working your knife down that silver skin, exposing this piece. So what you're left with is a venison flat iron. They're not very big, however, they are very tasty. And if you want to take the time to pull those out, it's a great addition to your, um, to your steaks. And they're very tender. Most people don't know they're located there. We just place them back in. That's where you would find your flat iron. So as we continue to go through the shoulder, Scott's working on the trimmings. We have another one, of course. So here again, you could use it for a roast. You can cut some jerky out of it. You can pull your flat irons or you could trim it out, um, the rest of it, what's left for your grindings. So what we're going to do next is we're going to remove the rest of the ribs along with a brisket and then we'll go on to the neck portion. I'm just going to, this is where it really helps to have an extra person. I'm going to hang on to this and let him get, get through this. This is the brisket. Um, it's your choice. Once again, there's, there's all kinds of schools of thought out there. Do you want the, now one, I want to point out, pause for a minute. So you'll find out a lot of times if you're trying to cut through muscle with a saw, it's going to be a, a lot of energy wasted. Seth just took his knife right here and he actually made a cut right to the bone. So that way, when he starts sawing, he's at the bone already. That's a short That's a great, cut. great point. A little pro tip for you. Don't waste your energy on, um, sawing muscle. Use your knife for that portion.
So we'll set those off. In, our, in this particular case, we're going to use these for our trimmings pile. Um, once again, Seth's just kind of prepping this before he saws it. No reason to saw through something that a knife can do the work. Here again, if you want to make a little cut through the muscle down to the bone. Here's another opportunity. You can, you can, you can do this with a knife. Somebody will probably point that out. Go through the vertebrae with a knife. It can be done. Um, if you got your saw handy. Now, once again, he paused here and he's going to complete that process. Now, the vertebrae is pretty much left um, devoid of meat. And we'll do a little bit further trimming on this just to make sure that we don't have any muscle going in the barrel. Um, it's also been brought up that the bones make good bone broth. That's certainly something you can do. If um, I were making bone broth, this wouldn't be my first choice, but you can do whatever you like. One of the things we want to do is make sure that we harvest all possible eating meat off of this carcass. So this is going to get set aside for our trimming. And um, the carcass now has been broke down into uh, the next step will be us breaking the muscles apart and going through these trimmings. Okay, so what we've got here are our guaranteed trimmings. We know that there's really not much else that can be done with these particular things that we have laying out on the table other than make them into a ground product. So what we're going to do, this is where you can really um, spend as much time as you sort of want. Um, each one of us is going to have to make a choice where you feel comfortable with your, um, the extent of the trimming and you say that's now bone, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to discard it, I've got the trimmings that I want. Um, so that's personal preference, how much time. Uh, we're pretty experienced at this, we know kind of where that balance is between, um, you know, I've got what I can get here, my time is more important, it's time to get rid of that and go. So we're going to take what we know are guaranteed trimmings off of the bone and that way we can discard these bones. Once again, like I said, if you're using bones for bone broth, these would not be my first choice. We've got some marrow bones on the other um, quarters that we're going to use. Now, um, something like this with this neck, you could certainly cut this into roasts if you, if you would like. Um, that's completely up to you. However, in this application, we are going to go ahead and take this neck and turn it into uh, trimmings for further processed items. So one of the things that we like to say is when you're, um, and you saw, I just, I actually pulled that. One, one, one of the things that you'll learn is not all the work has to be done by the knife. Um, sometimes you have an option where you can just sort of pull something apart. Another thing that we like to focus on is um, <clears throat> we don't take the product off the table. We always want to leave it on the table um, because that's going to be a lot safer. So yeah, don't, 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 do don't any... pick it up and start whittling in, in, in midair. We call this air boning. Yeah, we don't want to see you do that. And then the other thing is, is that generally speaking, what we do first is we, we take um, everything we can off of the bone. And so what that means is we don't necessarily start from the outside and work in. We start at the bone and work back. So what we'll do is we'll peel it. Um, and like I said, I'm pulling on this as I, as I, I debone it, but we want to start right against the bone and and take those trimmings off. And then if we have something in the trimmings we don't like, we can take it out. But don't necessarily start from the outside and work your way down to the bone. Start at the bone and work your way to the outside. It's going to be a lot more efficient to do it that way. All great points. And through this process, you know, we don't want to be wasteful. So we're going to spend um, as much time as we need to get these bones uh, pretty clean. Now you, you could spend all day doing this. Um, there's some common sense that plays a role there where you just simply can't get it trimmed out any longer. Um, we are going to do our best though to make sure nothing in fact goes to waste on this animal. The other thing is um, the steer is pretty lean. We will be adding some um, pork fat into the trimmings which is always a great point to there's personal preference there once again what you want to use we um, will sometimes find that taking the venison fat out of the product is maybe a, a little bit uh, more pleasant for the taste some folks like to leave it in the product that can also be determined on what you're actually working with this is a buck 
it's probably wiser for us to remove the fat. Um, once again, personal preference. Now, one thing that I'm doing here is I'm going to be actually making these into um, fairly small portion sizes because of the size of our grinder. That's also subject to what you're working with. Uh, in this case, we found that if they're about golf ball size, it seems to be about the right size. So we'll, we'll sort of cut these into length uh, and then cut them again like so. And that's going to allow us to get them fed through our grinder just real nice and also blended with our, um, with our seasoning that we're going to be adding. It uh, gives a lot of surface area so we'll have a, a really good product. And if there's any, um, any whole pieces in here that you would uh, see fit for maybe a stew meat, by all means, um, go ahead and cut little pieces like this um, for some venison stew meat. That's a great point. We like to cut um, lean whole muscle pieces make great stew, which you don't have a lot of sinew or something like that in them because you know that that will uh, yield a, a very pleasant eating experience. So as we work through this, we're making a really just a, a really nice pile. Um, another tip, turn the products over, uh, make, the, make the angles work for you. Don't find yourself um, sort of going down to find it. That, that, uh, that product there on the table can just be flipped around in any direction that makes it more convenient for you to extract the, the muscle from it. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the sinew in the meat, um, the gristle. With the proper grinding, um, as you can see, maybe a piece like this has uh, a few gristle lines in it. Certainly the, the heavy ones um, you do want to get. In the top of this neck, um, there's a yellow cord, and you definitely need to get that big, thick yellow cord out, but you certainly do not have to pick through every little thin membrane you find. Those will grind up just fine. You do have to get the thick ones. So I've determined that, that I've got just about everything that I can get off of this back. Um, the other thing you have to be cautious of, if you really start digging, you are going to start getting some more of the, that, that actual um, connective tissue. And the more of that that's in your product, um, the more connective tissue to muscle ratio, I guess, if you will, the more chance you have of hitting that when you're actually chewing on it. Um, here's another a, a good opportunity for you just to kind of visually inspect your, your product as you're going through it, looking for any hair or um, possibly a piece of contamination or something that you really wouldn't want to be in your final product, just go ahead and trim it out of there. Use the edge of your knife to, to get it cut out of there. So maybe a quick visual inspection. Keep your surface area. There's a, a chunk of that yellow cord, so we'll, we'll go ahead and extract that. Um, if you've got a set of work lights, go ahead and set those up. That's going to really help you out if you've got a nice, well-lit surface. So that way you can stay on top of what you're trying to do. And it's just really nice when you have a good, well-prepared deer because this process is just going to keep rolling along, going really well for you. And I'm telling you, we've got some really nice looking meat here that's going to turn out some wonderful products when we, when we add our seasoning to the meat, it's really going to enhance and not mask the flavor. It's just going to enhance the flavor of the actual venison and leave us with some of the best tasting venison that you've ever experienced in your entire life. One and thing, you'll have the personal pride of having done it yourself at home. One thing we do need to talk about, and we will more in the further videos, but it is the, uh, the glands in the venison. Um, I just located one right here inside the flank. So we have a gland. You definitely want to remove all those glands out of your deer trim. Um, and we'll, there's, there's one located in the round um, that's probably the most important. We remove them all and we will show you where that's located. So one thing you're going to find is when you're trimming this out, now this particular piece, I had a flank here and the interior of it has um, just some pieces of hair. It's bloodshot. And what I've been able to do is just separate that. It's a very thin piece. Um, now there's two choices here. You can simply discard that if you don't feel like the value 
um, is there as far as what you're going to do. Or you can use that um, fish filleting method. And here's where you want to flip it. And you want to put the dirty side down. And you're going to use your knife off of the corner of the table. So we're, you're actually going to use the leverage um, that this, this will gain you. And you can, you can find that angle where you can start actually removing just a very thin portion if you feel like you need to save. Now, now I've got that clean piece extracted from there and I can add that to my trimmings pile and the blood and the hair are all contained there and you can get rid of that. Um, and then the rest of this flank's looking beautiful, nice and clean. Um, Seth mentioned it, a little bit of silver skin here. If you feel like that silver skin is easy to grab and you wanna just get rid of it, go ahead and do that. Um, otherwise, it, your, your, your ratio of muscle to connective tissues is gonna stay really high and you won't have to worry about any of that. You, you can, um, just by sort of grabbing the, the thicker pieces of cartilage or the stuff that's obvious, you're going to be in really good shape and not have to worry about picking every little piece out. Another little pointer, um, as you can see, Scott and I are not wearing a cut proof glove. Um, we actually, you know, being in the business, we're not comfortable wearing them. However, if you're, if you're not experienced with a knife, um, you know, working in close quarters to your hand, you might want to go ahead and invest in a cut proof glove um, just to be on the safe side. Yeah, really obviously safety is something that um, you always want to be mindful of. It's not going to be very fun con completing this process once you've cut yourself. Um, so just be aware of that. Seth and I are wearing gloves. There's nothing special about them. They're just simply latex gloves because that's what we're accustomed to, to wearing. It allows us to interchange between um, different things without washing our hands. In other words, we can just peel the glove off and, um, and put a new pair on. That's personal preference. You can pick these gloves up anywhere, Amazon or online or just about anywhere that, ser that, that sells game processing is gonna have gloves similar to what we have here. If you pick up the uh, butcher kit from Outdoor Edge, it does come with a couple pairs of gloves for you in it. Right. Um, Throw a couple in your hunting pack for uh, field dressing too, makes it really convenient, especially since a lot of us are carrying phones. You wanna turn from one thing to the other, you can pull the gloves off and you're just simply ready to go. So as you can see here, um, I'm just taking my knife and cutting down through these ribs. Um, it's real easy to just take your knife and just run it right along the rib and you can pull these pieces of meat out in between the ribs uh, real easy like that. There we are, a beautiful pile of nice, wholesome venison trimmings that are going to be turned into some incredibly tasting products with our Bearded Butcher Blend seasoning if you, incorporated into them. If you hunt, you should never have a family member that says, I don't eat venison if you follow these steps. They're going to love it. Hey guys, Scott Perkins here from Beard of Bush Blend Seasoning. I've got a beautiful pile of deer trimmings here um, from a single deer. I, I've probably got about 50 pounds here, um, 40 to 50. And today I'm gonna be making bratwurst using our Beard of Bush Blend Seasoning. Now, these are conveniently um, in a six ounce shaker. Each shaker will do 12 pounds. Um, so I've got just about the perfect amount to do these trimmings right here. Um, original Chipotle, Cajun, and Hot are the choices. You can make one of each flavor and then you're going to have um, obviously four different flavors to choose from. I've also got some pork fat here that I'm going to be adding into these trimmings. We like to use about 10%. Seems to be about the correct amount. So I'm set up here. I've got my scale. I've got my pork fat. I've got my pile of trimmings. Most importantly, I've got my Bearded Butcher Blend seasonings. I've got a um, grinder and I've got a stuffer. So what we're going to be showing you how to do today is take this pile of trimmings and using our seasoning, produce some awesome tasting Beard of Butcher Blend seasoned venison bratwurst.
So I've got my combined 12 pounds of venison and pork fat, and I'm going to add it to this mixing bowl, and then I'm gonna add an entire six ounce shaker of our original Beard of Butch Blend seasoning to the, the grindings, or to the trimmings before we grind. So once I've added this to my bowl, I've added 10% pork fat. Now you can pick this up at your local butcher or you can just simply go to the grocery store and buy a pork butt roast, a boneless pork butt roast and get the same effect. So now here's where I'm gonna take, and because I have 12 pounds of meat and our magic formula is six ounces of seasoning to 12 pounds of meat, I'm gonna add this entire shaker of original bearded butcher blend seasoning to this bowl of meat trimmings. So we want to blend this up, coat all the meat pieces as evenly as you can. The grinder is obviously going to do quite a bit of that work for us too. And this allows us to marinate those flavors. And I got to tell you, the smell is making my mouth water. I'm so excited for this bratwurst. We've eaten it many, many times, but it always turns out to be one of our favorites. So I'll be adding this blended mix to my grinder and we'll be stuffing some bratwurst. All right, so now we're at the grinding step. So I've got my grinder set up. I'm just gonna go ahead and kick it on. I'm gonna start working my product through here. Um, one tip that I have for the grinding process is that you are going to have a plunger that you just start um, working it through. Like I mentioned, golf ball size pieces, sort of one piece at a time while we work this through here. And then once we're back into our mixing bowl, I do plan to add cheese and then we'll go ahead and move it into our stuffer. So there we have it, our ground product looks beautiful and now I'm going to kick it up a notch by adding some diced cheese. Now this can be found many sources online. Um, we really like to add it to the bratwurst because it adds a nice um, extra texture and of course the flavor is pretty awesome. And we should mention that this is a high temp cheddar cheese that we're using. It's important to use the high temp cheeses. Um, it has a higher melting point, that way it doesn't all ooze out of your product before you actually get to uh, enjoy it. That's right, so we like to add 10% um, to the, the bratwurst mixture. So you can just dump your cheese in and then, I guess much like you would need a loaf of bread, you can just fold that cheese into your bratwurst. So once you have this folded, um, all your cheese folded in there, it's time to go ahead and move this over to the stuffer. Um, today we're gonna be using uh, a five pound stuffer. So what we like to do is just make a few little meatballs, just like so. Get that in the stuffer and we can get to cranking out some bratwurst. Sometimes it's nice to have an extra set of hands. Um, Depending on how your bratwurst will stuff, different texture of the meat will sometimes yield different um, pressure that it will require. 
This is a collagen casing that we're using. Um, you can either use a collagen or you can use a, a natural casing. Today we're going with the collagen um, on these deer brats. As you can see, the products start to come down here. It's real nice. Weston has a, a tube that's clear so you can actually see the product coming through, through the tube. You can see it's coming right into the casings. As far as the how you should fill the casings, um, you, you basically don't want your air bubbles in the in the casing. So best you can do to keep those out. And like I said, sometimes you need a second set of hands for something like this, or you can just go ahead and C clamp it to the table, and that just gives you a little bit extra help. You can always add a little bit of water to your mixture if you want to um, have these stuff a little bit faster. That's entirely up to you and you can just kind of feel the process out as you move along. As you can see, it doesn't take us very long to produce a real nice supply of brats. <clears throat> There's uh, quite a few meals right there already. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut these into lengths that are about five inches long. That's going to put about, um, make about four lengths for a, a pound. Something that will fit nicely on a, on a bratwurst bun. So what you'll, what you'll want to do is just take, go ahead and snip the end of that loose casing off. If you take your hand, hold it like this, and go from the palm of your hand to your thumb, you can get a real nice size link. I'm going to go ahead and cut four of these. And there you have some delicious deer brats ready for the grill. Hey, what's up guys? Today we're gonna to be going through the process of cooking brats on a big green egg. Today I'm using the extra large big green egg. I have pre-lit the grill. We're maintaining a temperature of about 300 degrees right now. You don't wanna get the grill too hot. Um, it just takes a little bit too long for your temperature to come down for a nice even uh, cooking range for these brats. So what we're gonna be doing is a hickory barbecue pork brat from White Feather Meats. And we're gonna be doing an original seasoned venison brat. Now in our venison brats, we used our original seasoning. And in the pork brats, we used our barbecue sauce. So I'm gonna go ahead and open these up. I should mention that we like to cook our brats from frozen. You can certainly thaw them out if you want but these brats have thawed slightly, but they are still mostly frozen. So usually what I do is I just split my package, I break the brats open, and put the links right over the open hard lump charcoal fire for a direct cook. Now you can certainly set your grill up for indirect cooking and you can use your convector. Um, that process is just gonna take a little bit longer. So what we'll do now that the brats are on the grill is we're gonna go ahead and shut our lid and we're gonna maintain that temperature, let's say 300 degrees. Periodically, I will open the, uh, the grill. I'll use my tongs and I'll use my thermometer. I'll simply open the lid. We'll roll our brats around until it looks like you know it's time for us to start taking temps and at that point we want to reach an internal temperature on our pork brats of about 160 and on our venison brats about 155 so that's where we're going to take them to and um, stay tuned because we'll be pulling these off the grill here real soon
All right, so here we are. We're about 10 minutes in um, with our brat cook on the XL Big Green Egg. Our venison brats, these are complete. They have met temp of about 155. I'm gonna continue to grill the pork brats here until they reach that 160. We only have a few minutes to go. But as you can see, these brats started out as a frozen package. So there's no need to boil these or anything like that prior to cooking. So we simply opened up a frozen, frozen package of brats, put them on the big green egg at about 300 to 325, um, and we cooked these in just about 10 minutes. So I used a little bit of sugar maple, rockwood, wood chunks. I think that adds a real nice feature um, to the flavor profile as we're grilling these. So let's go ahead and pull temp on our pork brats and let's see where these are. All right, so we just hit 160 on the pork. These are done as well. So we're gonna go ahead and plate these along with our venison. And our brat cook on the XL Big Green Egg is finished. And we did that all in around about 12 minutes. Who's ready for a brat sandwich? You? I am. All right. I want to show you guys a little tip, Beard Butcher barbecue sauce. Right now, if I peeled this off, it wouldn't be a squirt bottle. It's pretty simple. We're just going to take a pocket knife. We're going to poke a hole right in the top of this bottle. And we're going to go ahead and hook Scott up with one of these amazing, delicious venison brats. This was uh, from a deer that we harvested. We processed it. And now we cooked it on the big green egg. Here we go. Hmm. How'd we do? Mozzarella cheese, hmm. original beer to butcher blend seasoning. Wow, that's fantastic. This is what you call living right here. Doesn't get any better than that. A real feeling of accomplishment from an animal that we harvested and cooked ourselves. So good. You gonna share? I don't want a bite of that. <laughs>